Good morning. We are so glad you are here to join us for our online experience. Whether you're new or you just stumbled across the stirring um, or you've been with us for a long time, we just want to welcome you. We have been so blessed to call the stirring home and to call the stirring family. And wherever you're tuning in, whether it's in your living room or somewhere else around the world, we are so glad that you are here. We want you to know that you are loved, that you are welcome, and that you are family. Yeah, Stirring Family, thank you for being with us. I just wanna pray a blessing over you as we move into worship. Lord, I pray that your spirit would be heavy upon your people this morning, that they would see your goodness and your glory and just rejoice with songs and with thanksgiving uh, at how much you love us. Amen.
Worthy, worthy are you, Lord Jesus, the King of my heart, yeah. King of the earth, oh. King of creation, oh God. Oh, oh, oh. oh King Jesus. Hey church, as we close out our worship time, I wanna tell you about a really fun event that we're gonna have this week. On Tuesday and Wednesday, we're hosting Like a Fire, which is a public reading of God's word from Genesis to Revelation. We'll start Tuesday at noon and go to Wednesday about one o'clock. And artists are gonna be painting and musicians are gonna be creating a soundtrack and the readers are gonna read. It's gonna be an amazing contemplative opportunity to come and soak in the great story of God. You can come and go as you like, but we wanna make sure all of you are invited to come and join us for this event. It's gonna be powerful and it's gonna be rich with God's presence. So come on out if you get a chance, spend a half hour, an hour and join us. Listen, it's been a wild week. I don't know what your experience has been like, but as I've gone through my week, I. I've experienced intensity and strife and, and fear. And uh, through it all, it's been an also incredible experience because every time, every day, I've also experienced God's provision. On Tuesday night, a young kid was healed in one of our youth gatherings. And as the youth pastor and I were talking about it, I realized that even with all the crazy stuff going on, God's still moving and even more importantly, God is still providing. When there's strife, he gives grace. When there's frustration, he brings peace. I just wanna remind you this morning that in everything that you're going through and all that's happening in our world, God is good and God keeps providing. As he's faithful to provide for us this morning, I wanna encourage you to give back to him from that place, that place of trust, and honoring God in his goodness and his provision. So let's bring our offerings this morning. You can text to give or go online and give. 
But as we give those offerings, I'd really like to encourage you to trust that God always provides for you in everything that's going on in your life. Father, I just thank you for our family, our church family, and ask that you would remind us today that you are always good and you're always providing. Lord, when we need grace or healing, you're there. You're with us. You're not abandoning us. You're not backing up, but you're leaning in. And Lord, we thank you for your provision as we give to you today. We remember that your provision is always good, always faithful, and always with us. Amen. God, we just thank you for your presence. We come again as a family. We come again as sons and daughters. We come again in worship and we come again to your word. And God, we just ask that you would meet us as a church in this divine moment and this divine space. God, wherever we are, God, listening to this message, whether with our families or on an iPhone, God, we just say, Holy Spirit, would you come? We ask for your abounding love, God, to meet us in the most profound and needed ways. We love you. We love your church. And we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. 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 Stirring family. I want to take a moment to address what happened last weekend while I was in Guadalajara. What happened this past Sunday was significant. And as always, we want to take a family moment and we want to talk honestly about it as it affected many in our church. Last Sunday's message and more so how it was preached did not and does not represent my heart, who we are, and where we're headed as a church. We've worked really hard these past few years, and especially uh, this past year, 2020, um, to lead from what we call the third way of Jesus, to preach the kingdom, to not preach the, the right wing or the left wing. And Understanding the beauty of the church is that we all come with different opinions and different experiences and different pains. And, and the beauty of the first church was Jews and Gentiles and charismatics and conservatives and, and uh, those coming from very different worlds, discovering their new life in Jesus and learning how to love deeply and learning how to live in disagreement, but stay at the table as a family. And although in Jason's message last week, there were elements of truth, we also recognize it did not carry the grace and and the heart of this house. And uh, and so I want to spend just a few minutes speaking to that right now. I want to share a few things with you, family. First of all, I want to say this, that as the, the lead pastor really as the the father of this family in this house, I want to apologize. I take full responsibility for any leaders, any preachers, any teachers um, that that I put on our stage to lead and equip our house. And I do not take this lightly. I've given my life to pour into a generation of preachers uh, to come alongside sons and daughters and equip them to preach the word and carry God's heart for not just the church, but the world. And so if, if I have offended you in any way, if I've hurt you, if I've wounded you, if you've lost trust in me, I want to ask for your forgiveness. And I want to say, I apologize because I, I take preaching and I take teaching very seriously. If you are hurt, Uh, I want that to fall on me. And I would do this for any of our team. Uh, I told our team this week, I'll take nine out of 10 hits anytime. Um, You've got to take a hit on your own. Every every leader has got to take a hit and you will live. Um, But I I take responsibility, um, church. Uh, Second, um, I want to say this. Um, Church, this is a significant moment 
for us. Yep. Yeah. I feel the weight uh, of this moment because how we respond yeah. to what happened last week matters deeply. The true test of family is in how we respond when we're hurt and offended. And in moments like this, we must again understand the beauty and the nature of the church. What God is actually doing here, we must understand what Paul describes as the body. Because when one part of the body is suffering, when one part of the body is hurt, when one part of the body acts out of order or unintentionally hurts other parts of the body, we do not disconnect. We lean in. Paul says we suffer with those who suffer. We ache with those who ache. We do not disconnect. And I, I've been proud of our Stirring family for not disconnecting, but connecting, even with concern. Um, the many in our church that have reached out saying they were hurt by the message, that they've reached out, that they've communicated. Now, now some have threatened to leave the church. And anyone who would leave a church or a family over one message after all these years does not understand the nature of family and the body of Jesus. That in times like this, we lean in. And we trust, we trust that in patience and in love that the head will know what to do with the body and to bring the body back into order. And this is how God has designed the church. And if we can't be a church safe enough to empower young leaders, if we can't be a, a church secure enough to empower sons and daughters, then we don't understand family and we don't get the kingdom. And when there's error, we correct it. And we hold sons and daughters accountable to what they say. And so this, this is, uh, um, I'm grateful that the stirring's mature enough to work through this. Right. And this is the family we are. And I'm so grateful for a family willing to stay at the table and uh, willing to extend grace even when they didn't feel the grace. Yeah. Finally, I want to say this. Jason Voon is one of my closest friends. I stand with him. I believe in him. He's invested deeply in this house for the past six years. He's not on paid staff. He has given his life to see this church grow in beautiful and prophetic ways. Jason's one of my favorite preachers on the planet. I wish he was here and I could stand with him. And I would, I would say to him, I affirm the call of God on your life, Jason. As I look back at, at my journey as a young leader and, uh, and some of the messes I made and some of the, the angst I had, some of the frustration, and I look back at some moments where, where it didn't come out the way I wanted it to and and uh, where it was more truth than grace, um, where, where I was leading more from my, my pain than, than uh, from God's truth. And I look back at those moments and the many people who walked out on me because they couldn't see my heart through the angst. But today, I am more profoundly grateful for those who stayed with me, who believed in me, who saw something in me even when I couldn't see it in myself. And as I spent time with Jason this week, these past, these past few days, Jason has expressed to me many times how deeply sorry he is for not expressing and representing my heart. And I so deeply forgive him for that. How we respond to what happened last week, whether you love the message or you were hurt by the message, is saying something to every son and daughter in our house. There's a generation of sons and daughters watching, and they're wondering, what will we do with a son? 
So we have a, a task right now, maybe some of us to do some heart work. Um, I'm asking you to pastor people that, that, um, that were affected by this, were hurt by it, were offended by it, people in your life that you're connected to. Um, I, I'm asking you to not only pastor people, but church, I'm asking you to protect Jason and Jess. It is so important that we protect, yeah. that we give no space for gossip. Right. Mm -hmm. This is what family does. So I want to pray right now. I want to invite Jesus, the head of this church, to come. We love you, God. God, we ask that you would pour out your grace upon this family. God, those who were fired up by this, this message, those who were hurt by it, God, these polarizing times that we live in right now, it's almost impossible to preach something that doesn't hurt someone. But God, in that, would you remind us what it means to be family? Would you remind us, God, of the beautiful risk of empowering young leaders and voices? God, would you remind us what it looks like to not just receive grace, but to extend grace, God. And God, in the weight and significance of this moment, thank you, God, for the maturity to stay at the table and fully represent the beautiful, unending grace of Jesus. And we pray this. In your name, amen. Amen. Well, I'm not sure how to transition into the message right now, so I'll kind of fumble through it. But a couple of weeks ago, I taught a message that we called Pioneers and Pillars. And as we've been talking about loving the world, one of the things we're convinced of is God's not just provoking new love for the world, but also renewed expressions of the church and the kingdom within the world. And so in this, in this theme where we believe God is leading us beyond religion, beyond offense, beyond triggers to be able to love a world so fragmented and so confused right now. God, would we become the greatest lovers on the planet? We talked about two Johns, John the Baptist and John the Beloved. As someone after the message, they, they made note of the fact that John the Baptist came from the church but left the church to start a new paradigm. When John the Beloved encountered God on the shores and ends up pastoring a church, only in the absurdity and the mystery of God do these two Johns, John the Beloved who becomes a pillar and a preacher and a pastor in the church of Ephesus to his dying breath, and John the Baptist, the rogue, locust-eating, wild man who leaves the old paradigm and ends up pioneering in the wilderness. Only in the mystery of God do these two Johns so brilliantly represent the church and the heart of God. Uh, Alan Hirsch talks about the two forms of the church, the, the local form or the pastoral form, and the missionary or the apostolic form of the church. And, and that the church to fully reach the world must be both pastoral and apostolic that it must be both local and missionary. And the tragedy that happens is, is the divorce between the two. That some have felt like they have to divorce one to devote themselves to the other. And the reality is when we don't have Acts 
242, the local discipleship form of the church, married to Acts 13, the apostolic sending, pioneering, creating form of the church. When we divorce the local from the apostolic, we end up with either a churchless mission or a missionless church. And it's always been God's heart that we as the church are both. And even though I may only be wired for one, I may be wired, wired for the local form and feel deeply called to it, I'm actually called to both. And even though there might be pioneers who, who are called to go and, and uh, create new expressions of the church that we've never seen before, we're called to both. And that's our heart to build a, a house where, where we, can, we can devote ourselves to Acts 2.42. And at the same time, we can send out those in Acts 13. And our sons and daughters that look at this form of church that we've built don't feel like they have to divorce this or leave this rebelliously to go build something like John the Baptist. And when I shared this a couple weeks ago, I had a 19-year-old young man who came to me after one of the gatherings, and he said to me, I've been in all kinds of churches. This is the first time that I've heard a leader or a pastor give me permission to dream of a church that doesn't look like this one. And I thought that was the most beautiful thing that I could have heard that morning. Uh, back in 2004, Erwin McManus spoke a message at a conference I was at for our denomination, our denomination, the Christian and Missionary Alliance. And in this, in this message, uh, Erwin was talking about the apostolic movement of the church, that, that we can't just be pastoring, teaching churches. We have to be evangelistic, apostolic churches if we're going to reach the world in ways that the local church could never reach the world. So in this message, he's talking to 5,000 pastors and leaders and missionaries from all over the globe, from the Christian and Missionary Alliance denomination. And Irwin has the audacity to say, listen, the problem is in your name. The fact that you call yourselves the Christian and Missionary Alliance is the problem. And he said, what we need is we need to get the Christian back in the missionary and the missionary back in the Christian. Uh, within a couple of years, we changed our name from Christian and Missionary Alliance to The Alliance. Thank you, Erwin McManus. And, and so I believe where we're headed, and, and I'll try to do some justice in this, in this uh, message, but we're, we're, we're headed to build the type of culture where people find their place on the wall. I think 2020 was really exposing for many of us, but it was also clarifying. And I don't know anyone who isn't, after 2020, wanting to actually put their hands to the right thing. And so church... Part of finding our place in the church and our love for the world is knowing what form of church God is calling us to build. Some of us deeply called to build the local discipleship movement of the church. Others called to pioneer new expressions of the kingdom that we have yet to see. And maturity is, as a church, we get to do both. Alan Hirsch says this, if we keep doing what we're doing, we'll keep getting what we're getting. And there's never been a greater need for the patient, authentic, loving presence of apostolic people, pioneering apostolic presence in the world. But the tension has been that in researching the 400,000 churches in our nation, that 96% of those churches have adopted a pastoral teaching model. And that only 4% are actually giving birth to new churches, new kinds of churches, new expressions of kingdom in the world. And this is why we are adamant to renew the apostolic movement of the church. That this form of church is not the only form God is after. And if we get stuck in a form, if we become obsessed with a form, when the forms be become our idols, 
we lose our sons and our daughters. And it's my heart to raise up John the Beloveds and John the Baptist, both equally church and equally representing Jesus. If you guys would turn to Ephesians 4, I want to dive in and maybe bring a bit more clarity um, to this pioneers and pillars message. Ephesians 4, 1 says this, Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you've been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there's one body, one Spirit, just as you've been called to one glorious hope for the future, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who's over all, in all, and living through all. Honestly, church, we could just take another offering and call it a day. This is one of the most profound, beautiful, theological, and practical passages in the Bible. But then Paul goes on to say this. He says, however, God's given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Jesus. Verse 11, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work, to build up the church, the body of Christ. This continues until we all come into such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. He says, no longer being immature, tossed to and fro, but instead as each one does its part, speaking the truth in love, we grow as the body. And as each part does its own special work, we become healthy and we grow in love. A beautiful anthem for the church today. So here's what Paul says, that however God's given each one of us a special gifting or a special grace or a special anointing. And then in verse 11, he says that, that this is, this is the, the gifting that some of us are apostles, some are teachers, some are prophets, some are evangelists. That each one of us carry a unique Holy Spirit gifting. Now, there's quite a few different ways to interpret this passage, and I know some have made it about leaders, that God's raising up leaders in the church, that some have this gifting and some don't. Others have talked about the office, that, that Paul's talking about office of prophet or office of apostle. But the way I read this and the way I've come to believe it is that, that each one of us, we are actually gifted to express Jesus in a very significant way. That some have a teaching gifting, some have an apostolic gifting, some are gifted as prophets, some teachers, some evangelists, and that each one of us, as we come into our gifting, as we recognize how God has actually designed us, that there's something about coming into the fullness of my wiring that helps us grow. And I love that Paul says this, that we need apostles, we need prophets, we need teachers, we need evangelists, we need pastors, we need all of it for maturity. What the Bible doesn't say is if we have good teaching in the church, we'll become mature. Right. What the Bible doesn't say is if, if you have good pastoring, it says, no, you need good apostling, you need good prophetic, you need, you need good evangelism, that as that the church fully expresses Jesus, Jesus the prophet, Jesus the apostle, Jesus the evangelist, that, that we express Jesus when we come into the fullness of what some have called the five-fold gifting here. Whatever language, I love the five expressions of Jesus. That as we step into the prophetic of Jesus and as we step into the apostolic or the evangelism of Jesus, that we actually become mature, that, that somehow in that maturity, we're no longer tossed to and fro, and that we reveal Jesus to the world. Mm -hmm. This is a beautiful passage. Now, I know there's, there's been some, uh, some confusion. Th this is fascinating, and I have to share this, that uh, 2008, 
years later, um, we all have kind of our own thoughts on this passage. We've all come out of, you know, different kind of schools of thought. But it's interesting that the word pastor only shows up once in the New Testament. So the word pastor, you only find once. Uh, The word teacher is used 68 times. And 52 times it's for Jesus. The word evangelist only used three times in the New Testament. The word prophet used 122 times in the New Testament. And the word apostle 72 times. There are 25 named apostles and even one woman named Junus in the New Testament. Only one evangelist named Philip. But there is not one named pastor in the New Testament. I'm just saying. (laughs) Now, Alan Hirsch goes on to say that there are there are capital A, big A apostles, the first 12 apostles. But as the New Testament talks about others with apostolic gifting, they would call apostles these others that they would consider those lowercase a apostles. Now, Listen, we struggle with this language, and I get it. I'm not saying that we need to give new titles. Um, A pastor friend of mine, he says, we don't need another tidal wave. (laughs) So we don't need, and I'm not into the titles, but I am into the biblical understanding here. It's interesting. I'm just saying, 2,000 years later, whereas the New Testament calls no one pastor and only uses pastor once, we call everyone pastor. Lead pastor, associate pastor, youth pastor, parking lot pastor, hospitality pastor, connect pastor. This is, I'm just saying, listen, I'm not opposed to it. I'm just saying it's more cultural than it is biblical. Biblically, biblically, God was releasing prophets and pastors and teachers and apostles and evangelists. God was raising up people in the church to fully express what Jesus is doing. And oftentimes it's the pastors and the teachers who who lead more in the local forum. It's the evangelists and the apostles who pioneer more in the missionary forum. And the the prophets just kind of like, they they love both. You know, they have voice for the, the world. They have voice for the church. When the Bible talks about teachers, these are those who carry a Holy Spirit gifting and ability in the church to teach, equip, and communicate God's story, God's truth, God's way, God's teachings relevant to the life, health, and effectiveness of the body of Jesus so that others will grow and come alive in him. When the Bible talks about the gift of pastor, the pastor has a Holy Spirit ability to care for, nurture, grow, and protect the long-term and immediate spiritual needs of those in the church. The teacher wanting people to grow, the pastor wanting people to become whole. The gift of the evangelist is the Holy Spirit anointing. God gives some in the church to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus with those who don't yet know Jesus in a way that that they come into new and irresistible resurrection life with Jesus. We need teachers. We need pastors. We need evangelists who are burning for those who have not yet met Jesus. I wish we had time to really preach and teach these giftings through. The gift of prophecy is the Holy Spirit ability God gives some in the church to receive and communicate the mind, the will, and the heart of God to others for the purpose of encouragement, comfort, and strength. We need prophets in the church that hear and speak forth the voice of God. The gift of apostleship is the Holy Spirit empowerment for leadership, for some in the church, for impact, influence, and authority beyond the walls, wells, and paradigms of the church to effectively establish new local churches and works and new kingdom expressions needed to expand the kingdom of God. 
And so God raises up these leaders. And I, I think one thing that's important as we talk about the pillars and the pioneers in the church is oftentimes uh, th this wiring, this design, it's let's not just lock ourselves into one of these giftings. Uh, often um, we carry what some would call like a primary gifting or a secondary gifting. And, you know, I think of Jim Bailey. Jim Bailey is a pastor. He is pastoral. He is Ephesians 4 pastor. Call him Pastor Jim. But he is also very apostolic. And I would say he has an apostle, an apostolic secondary gifting. I would call Jim Bailey an apostolic pastor. When I think of Amy Bailey, when I think of Pastor Amy, I would say Amy is a teacher. Her gifting is teaching. She's anointed to communicate and teach God's way and God's word. But she's also deeply prophetic. I would say Amy is a prophetic teacher. When I think of Mike Cruz, and, and who knows, I could be wrong on these, but when I think of Mike Cruz, um, Mike's primary gifting is prophet. He is deeply prophetic, but he's also an evangelist. And I would say Mike Cruz is an evangelistic prophet. And so as we kind of think through our gifting and find our place, listen, when we ignore our gifts and when we don't grow our gifts, we're actually robbing the body of maturity. And I know some are like, well, I don't need that. I just want character. I don't need gifting. And it's like, well, why can't you have both? There are people in the church that are, that are honestly, they, they're, they're, they're scared of the Holy Spirit. So it's, well, I don't need gifting. I don't need anointing. Let's, let's, you know, let's go to the next book that Paul writes. And I want character. But here's the thing. Like, so then you've got people with character, but without gifting. And there are all these people without character, but gifting. We need character and we need gifting. Yeah, yeah. And the reality is, I think some of our theology when it comes to the gifts is just selfish. It's about my gift and it's about, listen, it's, it's a gift. It's called a gift. Your gifting is to be given away. That, that's it. God gives you a gift to give away. And so let's not be selfish, church. Let's steward our gifting. I love what, what Paul says to, to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4. He says, he says, give yourself to your gift. Become excellent in your gift so that others may see your progress. And so as the church, as the people of God, there should be a sense of I'm growing my gift. There should be a sense that people actually see the progress on my life. Like, like, like wow, look at what's happening in, in uh, Cody's life. Or look, what, look what's happening in Allison's life. She's, she's becoming excellent in her gifting. That's what Paul says to Timothy. He says, become excellent. I want you so that people can see your progress. It should be normal for us to be cultivating and actually growing our gifting because your gifting is not for you. It's for others. Yeah. It's for other people in the church. So people just attending a church but not growing their gifting, whether it's pastoral or apostolic. If I'm doing nothing, if I'm neglecting or I'm staying ignorant of my gifting or not using it, as Peter says in 1 Peter 4, he says, use your gift. If I'm not doing that, then I'm actually robbing the body of maturity. And maturity is I'm no longer... We're no longer tossed to and fro by the waves of culture. So if I'm not growing my gifting, then I'm actually allowing this community to stay immature and be tossed to and fro. And so this is why, this is why I think Paul just says, hey, as each does its part, like God's given each one of you a grace and as each does its part, we actually grow and we become more and more excellent in our gifts. I mean, w w listen, what, what should be, what's normal is I'm growing my gift. What's not normal is to be in the church for 10 years and not actually grow. What, what's abnormal is to attend a church for years and not actually develop and cultivate the gift on my life. And so if we're going to love the world deeply, if we're going to not only deepen the Acts 242 local expression of the church, and if we're going to pioneer the apostolic, then we've got to come into a greater fullness of our gifting. And I have to say this. 
Uh, I have to say that, that just because you're called to the local doesn't mean you can't go to the apostolic. Every army needs a pastor. And every Navy SEAL team needs an instructor or a teacher. And so I can be pastorally wired, but deeply called to run with apostles. I can be apostolic and pastor a local church. I can be an evangelist and, and find great fulfillment in raising up more and more evangelists to go and reach the world for Jesus. So discovering who you are and, and what wall God has placed you on is going to help us as a church create a house big enough, secure enough, and safe enough for people who are called to pastor and shepherd and teach, and also those called to pioneer and to apostle and to evangelize the world. Amen? Yeah. Amen. All right. I feel like we just, we're just getting started, church, but um, I'm going to pray for us right now. If you guys would stand, just stand. Let me pray a prayer, and hopefully there was something in there that, that stirred your heart. God, I just, we thank you for your church. I've never felt more, God, more honored, more grateful to, to be a part of the church. And in, in a day where there's, there's so much, I think, animosity and accusation and, and polarization and division, God, make us a church that so values the, the wiring and design of each person here. And I pray, if you guys could put your hands out. God, I pray right now, and, and for those listening, God, that you would actually awaken gifts. Um, Paul said um, to Timothy, fan into flame the gift of God on your life that God put on you when we laid hands on you. And I just pray, God, you would put your hand on people, that people would come into um, their, their gifting, that, that the grace that Paul talks about in Ephesians 4, God. I'm asking you, raise up pastors who are anointed in our church. Raise up prophets who know your voice. Raise up, raise up apostles and those that, that, that dream of pioneering new expressions. Raise up evangelists. Raise up teachers that can communicate your heart and your way, God, in our day. And help us fumble through this like the early church fumbled through it, God. And we pray this in your powerful name, Jesus. Amen. Amen.